It's played out in a lot of ways. I think it was probably the best educational experience when I think about like grad school and different you know, experiences of grad school. Um, being in an environment that's predominantly women really shaped my education actually in ways that I didn't entirely, I think, understand until I was teaching. Um, undergrad students um, in a co-ed setting um, and really saw some of the distinctions and kind, almost a kind of college culture and I'm sure some of it's like small liberal arts school, big research university, but just things that I, parts of college culture I wasn't even aware of. Um, and I think, I guess, you know, some of my most enduring relationships are from that time in my life and in terms of the research that I just did, um, it's interesting. I, I was speaking with people in girls' detention facilities. So they're in, while people have a lot of gender identities and expressions, they're in a, you know, setting that's designated as being for girls or for women. And so I thought about that a lot as I was doing the research having gone to a school that was also, you know, designated as being for girls or women. Oh my God. <laughs> You know, it's so funny before when I was saying there are things about academia that sometimes felt like they contradicted the work I was trying to do. I actually expected IRB to be one of the hardest parts and it went quite smoothly for me. Um, I think it had largely to do with the particular person who was reviewing um, my work and who had some social work background and was really interested in what I was doing and thought it was important. Um, and so she really, you know, advocated and helped me um, shepherd the, uh, the application through the IRB process. I think it would have been um, way slower and more challenging if two things um, were the case. One, if I were interviewing people who were under 18 and two, if I were actually interviewing people who were in detention. I also think if I were interviewing people who were in detention, I would have heard really different things than what I did. I think that people would not have trusted me as much. I think that they would have been much more apprehensive about sharing some of the things that happened to them in detention because it's really a culture of retaliation. Um, unfortunately, I heard some horrific stories about um, different kinds of physical and sexual violence in detention that when people made efforts to report it, um, it kind of made their situation worse. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think that we're not really socialized to have those conversations in a lot of contexts, and so it can be a little bit awkward, but I was so used to doing it from being a practitioner and also from being an activist and feeling like I'm always, that's something I'm always, you know, having conversations about. Um, and so I did name it, and sometimes people are like, well, <laughs> like, I can't believe we're talking about this. Um, but I felt like, it was important and I also felt like in some ways it created more intimacy. Um, so I kind of just did it. Um, so there was one interview, it was actually my first interview um, and it was with a trans identified woman who had had a really bad experience in detention with a lesbian, actually, who was her cellmate. And she was telling me the story and, um, you know, was kind of apologizing in a way for not what happened, but she's like, I'm sorry, like, you know, I, I know a lot of good gay, gay women. And I was like, it's really okay, you know, this is the fact that you're trusting me with this information, which I know it's hard for you to say to me, um, is an honor. And um, 
I think that was probably one of the more actually intense interactions because it was such a horrible story and a horrible experience and also because of the unique um, aspects of our identity that were coming into play in that conversation. Do you say what was my training? My training was actually here in a lot of ways. Um, so I, I did, um, so there were not a lot of offerings in my own department, social work, um, and around interpretive or qualitative methods, and definitely not oral history specifically. I took a lot of courses in women, gender, and sexuality studies, and I found more of a home there. Um, but my, I think, fourth year in the program, I attended the Summer Institute, and that's where I really got into oral history. And I think that was the first time I learned about life history interviewing, I think, actually, from Dorinda Welly, who also um, has done research with LGBTQ youth. And that was like a breath of fresh air. Um, and also the fact that it's not specific to any one discipline, I think makes it a little bit of a liberating space. I think within my department, I definitely had to defend qualitative methods more generally. Um, social work, although it seems really contradictory, is still really quantitatively driven when it comes to research. And I happen to be in a program that is especially quantitatively driven. And I don't think I realized just how much that was true or what the like consequences or pressures were once you're there and you decide or you continue to you know do what you said you wanted to do. Um, but I, I felt much more like within my department I was having to kind of um, explain to some people what I was doing. My committee was really supportive um, and I'm super grateful for that but there were definitely people who just didn't think of it as credible research. Um, I think because I had heard a lot of the stories once already, and I felt like nothing could be more powerful than these using those stories to advocate, advocate for change in policy practice. I think that numbers have their place and their worth, and there are actually a lot of numbers right now um, floating around that are really useful about overrepresentation um, of LGBTQ youth and racial disproportionality in child welfare systems. But I think to get at the trajectories of what's happening for young people, to really look at things like the school to prison pipeline, to look at the nuances of identity, um, you just can't do that with like a survey, you know, and I, I think had I not, if I were going into a new community um, and not back to a place where I'd already worked, um, I, don't, I wonder if I would have felt as, I can only call it stubborn, as I was about using this particular method. I think in a way I might have because it is really also about who I am as a person. Um, but. I just really felt like um, the stats for this community needed to be supplemented with youth voice and, and personal stories.